Major funding for the State of the State Address is provided by New Jersey Education Association, NJM Insurance Group, Orsted, PSEG, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Additional support provided by New Jersey Realtors. This is NJ Spotlight News, special live coverage of Governor Murphy's 2022 State of the State Address, anchored by David Cruz. Hello, everybody. Welcome to NJ Spotlight News, live coverage of Governor Phil Murphy's 2022 State of the State Address. I am David Cruz. As many of you know, this speech is usually presented to a joint session of the legislature, but for the second straight year, the pandemic is forcing the governor to deliver this address virtually. He's speaking from the auditorium at the War Memorial. No audience, so don't expect a lot of applause. We expect to hear a lot about the pandemic, though, and the administration's handling of it, as well as what New Jersey residents can look forward to as the governor prepares for his second term. With me today are my colleagues, senior writer and projects editor Colleen O'Day and business correspondent and host of NJ Business Beat, Rhonda Schaffler. We will hear from Colleen and Rhonda after the speech, and we'll get a Republican response from Assembly Minority Leader John DeMeo. Plus, we'll hear from the man who challenged Phil Murphy at the polls just a couple of months ago, Republican Jack Cittarelli. That's all coming up, but first, let's go now to Governor Phil Murphy. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. My energy and optimism for the job ahead are boundless. They are shared by the residents I have met along this journey. I know we can make this vision a reality. In our administration's first four years, we increased overall investment in public education by more than $3 billion over what the previous administration did in their last four years. Our administration has held access to quality education as a core value. We believe that a good education not only equips students with skills and knowledge, but that it ultimately has the power to change the trajectory of someone's life. We put forward what I would put up against any other state as the most aggressive plan to move away from fossil fuels and toward a future based on clean and renewable energy technologies. From wind to solar to electric vehicles, we are on our way to putting New Jersey firmly back in our rightful place as a world leader in innovation. raising the minimum wage, passing earned sick leave, and expanding paid family and medical leave, making those at the very top pay their fair share, while at the same time cutting taxes for working families. When people think of small business, they think of the stores along Main Street that are owned by their neighbors and friends, which cater to the needs of the community and that hire from within the community if they're big enough to hire at all. President Biden has become fond of saying, help is on the way. Well, alongside this group here today, we can say definitively, help is here. And these aren't nameless, faceless corporations. These are not monolithic institutions. These are the names and faces that breathe life into a town and turn it into a community. We are working to improve our healthcare system because we know that a healthier New Jersey is a stronger New Jersey. No child in New Jersey should be left without the support and security of health care coverage. We will become part of a vanguard of states to give more children the guaranteed security of health insurance coverage. Thank you. For the past year, New Jerseyans by the millions have stepped forward to do the right thing for themselves, for their kids, their families, and their friends. This is how we're getting through this all of us pulling together. This is how we're going to come out of, from under the clouds of the pandemic and come out stronger than ever before. It's the New Jersey we should be. 
the New Jersey that together we can be. Together, let's build a stronger and fairer New Jersey that works for all of our families. My fellow New Jerseyans, our state constitution deems today the day on which I come to report to you on the state of our state. That accounting is clear. The state of our state is resilient and ready to keep moving forward. Because this is who we are as New Jerseyans. We believe in ourselves and we believe in each other. And we know nothing is beyond our reach because nothing is beyond our willingness to work hard. Under our state constitution, I will also have the privilege of returning here in one week's time to reaffirm my oath and to begin a second term as governor. I am extraordinarily honored and humbled by the responsibility you have given me, and I am excited by the possibilities that lay ahead for our state. And if that's not enough, I'll be back six weeks after that to propose my budget for the upcoming fiscal year. So over the next two months, and indeed the next four years, we're going to see a lot of each other. I will do my best to not wear out my welcome. We begin 2022 just as we did 2021. I'm once again addressing you from an empty theater. And our state remains on a war footing against a virus that has now taken on a form that is overwhelming our collective psyche as it tests our state. We're all frustrated by this pandemic. We're all tired of it getting in the way of everything we do. We're all ready to get on with our lives, and I am committed to seeing us get there, to schools where our kids' smiles once again light up the hallways and classrooms, to Main Street stores and restaurants where communities can once again come alive, to sports arenas where cheers are once again heard loudly and clearly, to living rooms where we can once again freely gather with family and friends, whether for a holiday, a birthday, or just on the spur of the moment and to workplaces that are again fully safe and humming with the promise of a prosperous future. It has indeed been an extraordinarily long two years, yet as inconvenient as life is for so many of us, it pales in comparison to what some have been through. We will never forget the loss that has hit so many of our neighbors, and we will forever honor the tremendous hard work and dedication of all of the women and men working on the front lines especially the doctors, the nurses, and staff across our entire healthcare system. Hard work, even in the face of great challenge, does not deter us as New Jerseyans. Hard work, especially in the face of great challenge, defines us. Just as we thought we had finally gotten ahead of COVID, the Omicron variant came along. Omicron is doing its best to stop us in our tracks and push us back. We will not let it. We are seeing new case counts that dwarf anything we'd seen to this point. Upwards of four times as many New Jerseyans have COVID today than did one year ago. 30,000 new cases a day. More new cases day to day than even at the pandemic start. Even the knowledge that illness from Omicron can be less severe is of little solace. As tremendous number of cases, even with the lower percentage chance of hospitalization that comes with them, mean that we have more people in our hospitals today than at any point since the spring of 2020. And it means that more of our fellow New Jerseyans are leaving us all too soon. In consultation with my partners in the legislature, I have taken the necessary step of redeclaring a public health emergency to ensure we keep moving forward, guided by facts and science, and that we keep doing everything we can to beat back Omicron and put COVID behind us. In your day-to-day -day lives, this step won't bring really any changes, but it is vital to ensuring our continued and coordinated response so we can move forward and put COVID behind us. A response that keeps our schools, businesses, and economy open and allows us to get back to a real and lasting sense of normal. A response that ensures critical testing supplies and vaccines can be distributed to communities where they're most needed and given to the residents who most need them. A response that protects the ability of our hospitals to care for the hundreds of New Jerseyans entering them 
because of COVID every single day. A response that ensures we are getting the data we need from across our healthcare system to make smart and forward-looking decisions. A response that keeps state, county, and local health authorities working together. And a response that ensures we keep following science and fact and not politics so we can keep moving forward. We're all in this together and we must keep moving forward together. But try as it may to knock us back and further divide us, one thing is certain, Omicron has not knocked us down. In fact, despite all the challenges, we continue to move New Jersey forward. Across New Jersey, nearly 90% of all eligible residents have received at least a first vaccine dose. Let me say that again, nine out of 10 eligible residents have now raised up their sleeve at least once. And 75% of you have completed your primary vaccination course. But, and here's an important but, we know that these initial courses, either the two-dose regimen of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines or the one shot from J&J, &J, they weaken after several months. It's more important than ever that you get your booster shot. Science and reality tell us what we once called full vaccination is no longer that. A booster is not a bonus, it is a necessity. So if you have not yet gotten your booster shot, here is what I ask of you, please go get it. The booster is proven to lessen the impact of illness to keep you out of the hospital. And every vaccine dose is a ray of light through the dark cloud that has hung over our families. Every dose gets us one step closer to regaining the life that we knew prior to COVID. To each and every one of you who have done the right things, worn your masks even when you didn't want to, found or made time to get your boosters and taken precautions even when it meant postponing precious family celebrations, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver and I thank you from the very bottom of our hearts. And so do so many millions of your fellow New Jerseyans who have done the very same. Across the nation, we've seen some of the worst that crises can bring out in people. The selfishness and self-centeredness, the public shaming and finger pointing, the deliberate misinformation. Now we've seen some of this in New Jersey, but to be sure it's a small minority. There are far, far many more of you who have done the hard work and proven our state's overwhelming selflessness and community spirit. You've proven our collective faith in science and facts and medicine and in each other. Our state has become a beacon of what's possible when we rise to face a challenge together with fearless optimism and not use it to cynically drive people apart. And if we hold together to shine bright just a little longer, we will disperse the dark cloud of COVID. We may not have yet fully conquered the virus, but we will never let the virus conquer us. We must get to the point where we stay in front of it and don't fall back again. And we will do just that. Even with the pandemic hanging over our work across the past two years, working together over the past four, we have accomplished much. And there is so much for us to take pride in and talk about. We inherited a state that worked for too few and which was at a crossroads. We chose to move the state in a new direction. We are moving New Jersey forward. Today, New Jersey is working again for the many, not the few. We have greater tax fairness. We've cut taxes for our middle class and working families and our seniors 14 times. And I commit to you now that the state budget I propose in a few weeks will not raise taxes. We have more accessible and affordable health care and child care, stronger public schools and more affordable higher education. Our economy is growing again. Across the nine years before I took office, New Jersey's economic growth ranked 47th among all American states. Today, we rank fourth, from 47th to fourth. That is real progress, despite all we've been through and all we still face. Our state is growing again. For years, we were fed a line that no one wanted to be a part of our New Jersey family. But the truth is the exact opposite. Our population is growing. Our real estate market is strong. And we're making more progress against property taxes than any administration before us. 
through the policies we've put in place and the community investments that we've made. Our administration has slowed the rate of property tax growth more than any of the previous four administrations, a record that, by the way, includes four of the lowest year-over-year -year increases in property taxes on record. The reality is this. We're making New Jersey the place where businesses want to locate and families want to live. The census counts it in black and white. While some states in our region lost population, New Jersey grew. Turns out the moving vans are driving into New Jersey. Now, in any number of issues which are national in scope, combating senseless gun violence, protecting the fundamental right to reproductive freedom, facing the existential crisis of climate change, ensuring that every newborn and every family have a healthy start, repairing a broken criminal justice system, standing firm for the rights of organized labor, and securing the dignity of our LGBTQIA communities, to name just a few, New Jersey is now an unparalleled leader. And New Jersey, yes, New Jersey, is ranked as the best state in which to live for our safe communities, education system, health care, and quality of life. We are the number one state in America to raise a family. We are a model that others now seek to emulate. And we have achieved these accomplishments during the most difficult of times and against some of the darkest of backdrops. And because we all know that these times are not yet over, neither is the work we are prepared to undertake in this new year. Over the course of the past two years, nothing has been as important to our state than the health of our families and friends. But we know that the cost of health care remains a critical worry for many. And too many families are one illness away or one high cost prescription away from financial insecurity. But we are making high quality health care both more affordable and more accessible. Since our administration took office, health insurance rates in the individual marketplace are 22% lower than they would have been without our actions. And for the year 2022, enrollment in health insurance through our individual marketplace is up 25% over last year. So here's what that means. More people have insurance and they're paying less for it. And this upcoming year, we will continue to directly take on increasing costs to make healthcare more affordable and more accessible. A few weeks ago, I initiated a new program to help us in this effort. It started by working with hospitals and insurers to secure a commitment to limit the growth in healthcare costs across the next five years. And it will continue by, for the first time, giving us the comprehensive data that we need to break down the individual drivers of higher costs so we can take concrete action to lower them. I will also send the legislature a plan to address prescription drug affordability, from life-saving medications to the pills millions of residents take every day to maintain their health. This effort will be centered on making pricing across the entire supply chain more transparent so we can see what drives drug prices higher and so then we can lower them. Lower costs will save families hundreds if not thousands of dollars every year. But across the programs our state administers, from Medicaid and family care for low-income families to PAD and senior gold for older residents, lower, lower costs can save us and you untold millions in tax dollars. Containing and lowering health care and prescription drug costs isn't just good for your family's health and bottom line, which it is, it's also good for our state's bottom line. And this is the year where we will see one of our most innovative plans for economic growth take hold. Our groundbreaking new public-private partnership, the Innovation Evergreen Fund, will get to work, pairing both public and private investment to support the next generation of leading-edge technology startup businesses. In 2021, leading businesses from throughout the innovation economy announced their decision to move or grow in New Jersey decisions that will create thousands of good jobs. But we don't want New Jersey to just be a place where businesses move to. We want to be the place where they are born and grow. The Innovation Evergreen Fund will be critical to making this goal our reality. As I noted, we moved from 47th 
to fourth in the nation in economic growth. Our smart and focused effort to reclaim our historic place as the world's most innovative economy is one of the major drivers of this and will continue to be. And while we take on these new initiatives, we also have some unfinished business from 2021 to attend to. I thank and congratulate the legislature on passing and sending to my desk a bill that will secure a women's access to reproductive care and her right to choose into state law. These decisions must be kept between a woman and her doctor, period. I will sign this into law this week. And I'm especially proud that we're getting this done before the United States Supreme Court renders its ruling challenging Roe v. Wade, which it is poised to overturn. And I urge the legislature to once again take up the next phase of common sense and comprehensive gun safety reforms. We cannot go another year without closing dangerous loopholes or requiring safety education for would-be gun buyers, giving law enforcement new tools to go after criminals, and banning super high caliber weapons which have no place in the woods for hunting, let alone on our streets. Over the next six or so weeks, our administration will continue undertaking the work of crafting our proposal for the fiscal 2023 state budget. That document is where the vision we set out today is brought, brought not just into relief, but brought to life. We will continue to focus on a broad-based economic recovery that works for everyone, not just a lucky few. We will continue to focus on making New Jersey more affordable for everyone. We will continue seeking fairness for our middle-class taxpayers and working families and seniors to deliver for them with concrete benefits that make their lives and those of their communities better. As I mentioned, the budget I put forward will not come with any tax increases. And we will continue our work taking on the one issue that has stood in the way of too many New Jersey families for far too long, property taxes. Getting these things done will require hard work, but it is not insurmountable. I know it isn't because we just completed a four-year cycle where we made possible what so many for so long had said was impossible in Trenton. The very first day I took the oath of office, we undertook the hard work to strengthen and grow our middle class, to make New Jersey more affordable, to create opportunity for our middle class and our working families, and to ensure fairness for our seniors and the next up and coming generation looking for their toehold in the American dream. And of course, over the past two years in particular, we've undertaken the hard work to pull our state back from under the cloud of a global pandemic. And because of the hard work we've already put in to build a more resilient and more affordable New Jersey, we start the next four years of our journey together in a better place. For example, before the pandemic, we saw our state achieve the lowest sustained levels of unemployment since the state began keeping records of unemployment. The pandemic for sure put some of this progress on pause, but every day more New Jerseyans are now getting back to work in jobs that pay better, that have better benefits, and that can lead them to a better career. Many of our residents are getting back to work because of our direct and critical investments in tens of thousands of small businesses, $800 million for retail stores, restaurants, arts and cultural institutions, childcare providers, and many more to ensure their survival through some very, very dark times. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy and we're keeping that backbone strong. Many others are getting jobs in the new high-tech and innovative industries we have brought to our state and those which are taking root here. They're finding work in the burgeoning green energy industry, in the growing fintech sector, which, where, by the way, we added more than 3,000 jobs last year in that sector alone or on movie and television production sets, or in the online gaming and sports betting space we now dominate, and of course, in the life sciences. They're going to work in the construction trades, from the South Jersey Windport rising in Salem County to the Paulsboro Marine Terminal, where we will create more than 1,500 new jobs to secure our place as a global leader in offshore wind component manufacturing and logistics or to the hub in New Brunswick, where doctors and researchers will work 
side by side on the next generation of life-saving treatments. Many jobs await in the cannabis industry ready to take off. New businesses and jobs are being created because we restored common sense and fairness to our, our system of tax incentives. Some are coming because we're not afraid to run with new ideas for attracting new businesses, like the Innovation Evergreen Fund. Some more are coming from a long overdue sense of fairness and justice, values we know resonate around corporate board tables just as they do around kitchen tables. Others, however, are coming to New Jersey because they know that right here is where they will find the best trained workforce in the most advantageous location with the best public schools in America for their employees. Education is a critical piece of this puzzle. Our best of the nation public education system and world-class colleges and universities turn out the best trained and best educated workforce in America. Businesses that come here do so because they know we have a nearly bottomless well of talent from which they can draw. And we're not just restoring, but creating real opportunity for our young people to stay here and start a career to support a family or opportunity for those currently in the workforce to build a new career, or opportunities for entrepreneurs to maximize their investment and prosper, an opportunity for sure to make New Jersey the launch pad for the next great idea in the home of the next generation. We have shown you can make economic progress and social progress at the same time. In fact, one helps the other. The proof, well, as I've mentioned, we've jumped 40 three spots in economic growth among American states, from 47th when I took office to fourth today. That is exactly what stronger and fairer looks like. This is what creating opportunity looks like. This is what building an economy that works for every family looks like. So many of you across the state, state legislators, county and local officials, advocates, ordinary residents alike, have contributed greatly to this progress. And for that, I say thank you. But I also say, let's keep it up. But we also know there are many who do not yet feel your place is secure in this progress. And it is you to whom I recommit my efforts. Your place is set. Your seat is here. When we began our work in January of 2018, our state was stagnant and seemingly broken. The status quo worked for a few but left out the broad majority of New Jerseyans, hardworking New Jerseyans who didn't want any special treatment, just a fair shot at a better future for themselves and their families. We leveled the playing field by embracing true tax fairness and asking the wealthiest New Jerseyans, those with incomes in excess of a million dollars, to pay a little more in income taxes so we could do more for everyone across our state to do more to open opportunities for more New Jerseyans, to gain the tools that they need to have their own prosperous future. And let me make one thing very clear. I do not begrudge anyone their success. I do not begrudge anyone the realization of their American dream. However, the price for having an unlimited upside cannot be an unlimited downside. New Jersey will never move forward if we cling to the outdated and selfish notion of I got mine and the rest be damned. The pandemic is an example of how we are all in this together. Millions of New Jerseyans working selflessly have done the right thing for themselves and their families and in the process for all of us. Four years ago, New Jersey's minimum wage was $8.65 an hour a wage that locked countless hardworking New Jersey families into a cycle of poverty. Today, our minimum wage is $13 an hour, and it's on a path to $15 an hour, with hundreds of thousands of families now starting to reach up and pull themselves up into the middle class. Here's an obvious truth some still try to deny. One meaningful way to make New Jersey more affordable is to make sure more New Jerseyans have a living wage and we are on that path. Moreover, we are seeing wages increasing across the state and are now trending higher than before the pandemic. This means that as our people get back to work, they're getting back to jobs that pay better. That is yet another way we are building opportunity for more New Jersey families. 
Four years ago, our schools and property taxpayers were reeling after eight years of diminished investment. We got to work investing in our communities by investing in our public schools from pre-K all the way through to graduation. Today, New Jersey's public education system is ranked the very best in the nation. And we continue to bring more and more students and more communities under that banner. We invested $3 billion more in our public schools across our first four years than the prior administration did across its last four. This year alone, we're investing $1.5 billion more in pre-K through 12 education than in the year I took office. Now, we're doing this not just because our kids deserve it, which they do, but because our property taxpayers do as well. School funding is property tax relief. Every single one of these dollars that we as a state have invested is a dollar kept in the pockets of property taxpayers, whether it be the state aid supporting our students and educators in their classrooms or construction aid to build or renovate schools to serve a 21st century education. Strong public schools make communities more attractive for families looking to move to New Jersey. And for so many of you, your home is your single greatest investment. Few public investments will protect the value of your home more than strong and properly funded public schools. But tackling property taxes goes far beyond just properly funding our schools. And here too, we've made real progress. When the federal government cut your state and local tax deduction, which I continue to work tirelessly to restore, we expanded the property tax deduction allowed in your state income tax filing. We expanded eligibility of older homeowners for the senior freeze program to protect you against any property tax increases. We modernized the homestead property tax rebate. And this past year, we delivered tax rebates of up to $500 to nearly 700,000 middle-class families. We extended property tax deductions for veterans and service members, and God bless them all. We have also made in-state tuition payments and investments in college savings plans tax deductible. We put into law the state's first child and dependent care tax credit and made every family making up to $150,000 a year eligible for it. Each of these steps is making our state more affordable and giving middle class and working families and seniors the tax breaks that you all deserve. So I'll repeat our record on this. The slowest rate of property tax growth that during any of the previous four administrations and four of the lowest year-over-year -year increases in property taxes on record. And 14 middle-class tax cuts made possible only through a commitment to fairness. And we've done so much more. I've noted our work to lower health care costs, particularly for those with children. We've put a college education within reach with our tuition-free community college program. And we invested in our child care providers to make this critical service more accessible for families getting back to work. This is the progress we can make together by putting our focus in the right places. And this is the progress that results from restoring responsible leadership to our state's finances. For example, four years ago, no one thought we would ever pull ourselves up and out of the hole that prior administrations and legislatures had dug our pension system into. This not only hurt our hardworking public employees and retirees, but it threatened our very financial health. But working together, we made living up to our obligation a priority. And in this fiscal year, we are making the first full payment into our public pension funds in 25 years. With these investments, along with a strong stock market and a new and more responsible investment strategy, our pension funds are performing better than ever. And we've saved tomorrow's taxpayers billions of dollars by living up to our obligation today. We also reined in the cost of public employee and retiree health benefits while preserving the high quality care. For example, we've cut more than $36 billion from the projected long-term costs of providing health care to our retired and public employees alone. That's good for them for sure, but it's good for you all as well. And the size of state government itself is smaller today than it was 
when we took office. Four years ago, NJ Transit was a national model of how not to run a mass transit system. Today, it stands as a model of how to turn around a mass transit system. When we took office, NJ Transit riders had suffered through eight years that saw them paying 36% more in fares, but receiving less reliable services in return. So, rider safety, once a back burner issue, has been restored to the forefront. New locomotives and passenger cars and newer and cleaner running buses are not only finally on order, but being delivered and put into service. The shortages of train engineers and bus operators that led to canceled routes have been backfilled, giving NJ Transit the roster it needs to keep lines running. And on-time performance is up, and cancellations and delays are down. And we did all of that without asking customers to pay one penny more in fares for four straight years. Over the past four years, we've also restored a basic sense of social and environmental justice, including enacting the nation's strongest environmental justice law. We've expanded and protected voting rights, and we've started down the long path of true criminal justice reform that will ultimately lead us to safer communities and stronger bonds of trust and goodwill between law enforcement and the residents they serve. We took on a focused and data-driven effort to combat the tragic ongoing opioid use epidemic, even as we fought the coronavirus pandemic. In that, we replaced stigma with compassion to close gaps in treatment, to expand access and use of life-saving medicines like naloxone, and to support and expand the work of harm reduction centers, among so much more. While we are proud of the progress we are making, this critical work is far from done, and it will continue. We continue to lose too many blessed lives of residents to the grip of opioid misuse. Four years ago, we set out to build a stronger and fairer New Jersey that would work for every family and in every community. We set out to make a more affordable and more responsive New Jersey. Well, we are who we said we would be boldly progressive, but also pragmatic. And because of this, we are accomplishing both. Note that I say accomplishing, not accomplished. We still have much work to do. We are still clearing away the long fallen brush that has blocked the path to opportunity for too many New Jerseyans. Our task now was to take the next giant leap forward, to turn the positive changes we've made in our laws into la long lasting and tangible progress for our working families and seniors. A few hours ago, my partners in the legislature swore their oaths as the representatives of the residents they now serve. Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver and I congratulate the new Senate leaders, Senate President Nick Scutari and Majority Leader Senator Teresa Ruiz, as well as the returning assembly leadership of Speaker Craig Coughlin and Majority Leader Lou Greenwald. And we hold out our hands in partnership and goodwill to the new Republican leaders, Senator Steve Oroho and Assemblyman John DeMeo. The people of New Jersey elected each of us in public office for a single purpose, to get things done. Up until November 2nd, we wore either a letter D or R after our name. And we all take great pride in that letter. That letter speaks to a sense of our core beliefs and our personal ideals. But now is the time to take these letters off. Now is the time to seek, in the words of John F. Kennedy, and I quote him, not the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. You all are sick and tired of the hyper-partisanship, the bickering, the inaction, the division, and the endless finger pointing we see in Washington. Well, so am I. And we don't want that political stagnation to creep into our work here in Trenton, not in our very backyard not when there is still too much uncertainty in our lives and our communities and too many challenges ahead. From today forward, for all of us, the politicking ends and the governing begins. That's true patriotism. We must continue to prove that the promise of a stronger and fairer New Jersey is real and that it's open to every resident, every family, and every community. Opportunity, affordability, 
and fairness must be linked. One without the others is hollow, but all of them together are an unstoppable force for a brighter future and proof that the American dream lives in New Jersey. And no state represents both the glorious history and awesome future of the American dream more than ours. So this is our shared task for the year ahead. A stronger New Jersey where we create opportunity and increase affordability because you want New Jersey to be more affordable. A fairer New Jersey where we work for tax fairness and economic and social justice because you want a fair shot at a more prosperous future and at your American dream. And a New Jersey where we continue down the path of recovery from the pandemic together. This is what you expect. Moreover, this is what you deserve. Let's work together in good faith and with common purpose. This doesn't mean we won't or even can't disagree, but it should mean that compromise and common sense are not dirty words. The response to an idea with which we disagree shouldn't be no period, but rather no but, meaning an openness to cooperation and negotiation, to give and take, not to take it or leave it. Let's always be mindful of the words of the late John Lewis, and I quote him, we're one people, we're one family, we all live in the same house. With everything going on across the nation, and as we work to bring our state out from under the cloud of COVID, these words ring true in New Jersey. Let's pledge to put the needs of every New Jerseyan before the wants of our party or any single person in it. Let's stop shouting down each other and get back to talking with each other. Let's prove that our words have actual value and meaning. And let's prove that our best days aren't in our rearview mirror. Let's grab that more affordable New Jersey, a New Jersey rich with opportunity for all willing to work hard, which is just ahead of us. Thank you all. May God bless you and your families with a healthy and prosperous new year. And may God continue to bless the great state of New Jersey and the United States of America. You are watching live coverage of the governor's State of the State Address. I'm David Cruz. So there you have it, just over 30 minutes. Governor Murphy referring to a war against the virus, that virus which has dominated the work of this administration for the past two years and still does. He touted the high vaccine rates, 90% of residents with at least one shot, 75% of us with at least two shots. But he noted that the fight was ongoing, saying we will never let the virus conquer us. To that end, he declared or redeclared a public emergency, which could put him at odds with the legislature, which did not vote to extend his emergency powers in its final voting session yesterday. He also talked about the administration's accomplishments on cutting taxes, reforming the tax incentive program for business, and promising no new taxes in his next budget. Let's bring in our digital senior writer and special projects editor Colleen O'Day and anchor of NJ Business Beat and our business correspondent Rhonda Schaffler. Ladies, uh, good to see you both. Colleen, I guess we should start by acknowledging that it's not easy to give a 30-minute speech to an empty auditorium. You know, usually the state of the state is a big day at the state house with lots of pomp and ceremony and excitement. None of that today. Do you think that it might have affected the tone as in was it appropriate for the current times? You know, one of the things that we usually do on State of the State Day is count how many times the legislature applauds or, you know, or the audience. So, yeah, yeah we, we certainly have no way to know um, just how this speech has landed with, with lawmakers because they weren't there. Um, now, one could ask the question, did he need to give this speech to an empty auditorium? I mean, the legislature has been working in session both both houses, but it is a choice that the governor made. He's been very cautious about the, the pandemic. You know, I think he, he talked about the pandemic. He did use that war um, analogy, as you pointed out, and that certainly would seem to be appropriate given that we have these, you know, these rising numbers or, or I guess we've, we're not rising anymore. Maybe the hospitalizations are, but we've got these high numbers of cases. Um, you know, I think that overall he, he kind of presented more of a, a, a view of the four years of his, his administration, not the last year, which is something that seems like a little bit different, although given it's, 
you know, he's finishing his first term, perhaps that was appropriate. Um, you know, and I think what, what he was pushing was stronger and fairer again, um, as opposed to giving us any real new insights into what's coming next. Rhonda, the business community watches this speech, hoping to hear some encouraging words. Was there anything in there for them to like? Yes and no. Uh, in terms of what they like, no new taxes. Of course, that always goes over well with the business community. But there were some specific items the business community wanted to hear and they did not. Uh, the statewide chamber of commerce saying they think we need more money for small businesses we did not hear that we heard how much money was spent we did not hear about new programs to come uh, businesses also wanted to hear about the state's unemployment insurance fund this has been a big issue because businesses have had to pay to replenish it they believe the state should step forward with some money on that and also from the chamber, they want to see the state's return and earn program that pays for workplace training and gives workers a bonus when they go back to work. They think that needs to be beefed up because companies cannot find workers. We've got a big problem with worker shortages. So as Colleen said, there was a lot of looking back, um, looking forward. There was no promise of additional money to come that hasn't already been spoken for. Hardly anything in here about uh, social justice agenda, police reform, com uh, civilian complaint review boards. Did the, spe the speech maybe announce without specifically announcing that affordability and so-called kitchen table issues are now up front? Colleen? You know, I, I think that the governor has certainly said tons about social justice throughout his his first administration but you're right the the speech was really lacking in any specifics in that area you know the governor does not necessarily agree with all of the proposals that have been put in the legislature at least the old legislature we don't know what kind of new proposals might come up um you know because we do have many i think it's about 17 new lawmakers coming in so there may be some new plans there but i, I don't think there's a reason to think that he's not going to focus on that anymore it's just we really have no idea where he's going at this point he is going to give two more speeches recent soon as he pointed right. out so you know, we should expect maybe to hear some more details in one of those or both of those. Yeah. Rhonda, moving from 47th to 4th in terms of economic growth, 14 uh, tax cuts. Can you back any of that up? Well, I, can, I can't add up the 14 tax cuts. We have to fact check that. But certainly Governor Murphy did talk about some recent tax cuts in the last budget beefing up the homestead rebate, for example, giving some tax breaks to families. So yes, he gets some there. Of course, he's raised taxes on higher income um, folks, for instance. But on the economy, he's referring to the fact that in the third quarter of this year, New Jersey's economy grew 3.7%. That was better than the states that he referred to. Obviously, we're coming off a weird time for the economy. We just were right. cratered during the pandemic. So in many ways, it's hard to make these kind of even comparisons. He did make that reference to the labor market getting hit. Our unemployment rate in New Jersey does remain well above the national average. So, you know, looking at the economy, you kind of have to look through many lenses yeah. after you come off a devastating recession like we did. I will say, we are recovering jobs faster in New Jersey than we did during the last recession. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised he didn't mention that. So um, yes, there is some growth. It's obviously not even, but he, he is correct that uh, we were fourth. All right, Rhonda Schaffler, Colleen O'Day, good to see you both. Thanks for coming on with us. Uh, let's turn now to the Republican response, which also won't, delivered, won't be delivered in the traditional way. Joining us to share the reaction of the minority party is Assembly Republican leader, John DeMeo. Leader, congratulations on the new job and thanks for coming on with us. Thank you, David. Uh, it's good to be here. It's been quite a, quite a busy day. So, so what did you take away from watching this speech with us? Well, obviously it was a speech that was written for and uh, by the governor. So it's going to be a very rosy I almost seemed like I was living in some kind of fairy tale land, just just watching. I mean, talking about uh, you know minimum wage and stuff. These things, yes, they have occurred, 
But the only real way, Dave, to increase income potential is through training and job improvement. If you take a look at how inflation has eaten up much of these gains that have been made by paying people more money, literally they're not any further ahead than they were before. Uh, we have the uh, minimum wage that have, has been increased. The, these people are still in the same kind of situation uh, when really job skill improvement would really be the way to get yourself out of that hole. That just, that, that's one thing. And he talks about the vaccines understood. But right now, for the last few weeks or month, it's became, it's become quite apparent that frankly, we're woefully short on testing, it, testing uh, supplies, uh, anywhere you try to get appointments to get tested so people would be able to know they're infected and stay home. There's lines around urgent care centers. There's filled up appointments for days on time. You, it's hard to even get appointments and even home health, uh, home tests are hard to, to get. So uh, it seemed like there was some, some, some things that were lacking on the testing end of this, you know, almost two years into this pandemic, you would think that we may have had some, uh, some that some more supplies on hand ready to roll out to help protect people from the spread the governor said he's cut taxes 14 times the state is a leader in new job growth and innovation wind power a growing cannabis industry what's he not saying i don't know i mean uh i we, we i mean is he right to make those positive claims well, I, I would say that we had a, a significant dip in jobs when the pandemic hit, and now there's been recovery. Yeah. How many of these jobs are new jobs versus uh, people just getting back into the workplace? Uh, you know, he talks about um, uh, New Jersey being uh, 47, from 47th up to, uh, to number four. Um, that is like a one quarter measurement compared to like nine years. Right. Uh, so declaring emergency. Really he declared an um, emergency statewide. Um, emergency powers. What powers would you approve of him having after this emergency declaration? Well, I don't know. We'll have the opportunity to approve or disapprove. You know, if he's declaring is it, is it an executive order. Um, the i'm not i'm uh, not I sure i mean he he's making several executive orders putting them back into action are you saying that you don't you don't expect lawmakers to have a say well yesterday there were bills on that were pulled that would have given us yeah. a say. and now for some reason i guess he made a comment to the effect yesterday that you know he didn't need the legislature to act if they didn't do it the way he wanted it done that he would go ahead and just do an EO. So I guess the uh, former Senate president pulled the bill and that was the end of that. So uh, it didn't sound like there was a cooperative effort even between the uh, Democratic majority in the Senate and him on that issue. So as to exactly what he's doing with it right now, we don't know. Um, Let me ask sure. you this, uh, Assemblyman, with just about 30 seconds left. Uh, has he set himself up for good relations with your party in this second term? Look, we're, we're, we're going to work with the governor where we can. Uh, he, he's, his office has reached out to us, Senator Orojo and myself. And where there's agreement, we will work together. That's what we should be doing. And obviously, um, if there's not, All right. we don't have agreement, we're going to let him know. I'm going to have to leave it there. Assembly Minority Leader John DeMeo. Thanks, man. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on with us. Thank you, David. Let's turn now to the man who, if things had gone another way in November, would be watching this speech with a very different perspective on things. Jack Cittarelli, looking well rested. Good to see you again, man. Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you, David. You know, seven hours sleep a night, three meals a day ain't bad. I, I, I'd rather be nice. uh, transitioning your state government, but it is what it is. Any part of you today saying, damn, if only... Hey, listen, uh, David, I'm disappointed in the outcome of the election, but not disappointed in the effort. Um, I, I'm at peace. We emptied the tank. We gave it our all. The people have spoken. I want the governor to be successful, but I got to tell you, that was one hell of a state of state. I, I think the governor might be smoking some of that cannabis. He's really anxious to get into the market. 
Well, what about it made you think that he was high? Well, here's the part that uh, I, I found a bit satisfactory is he's talking about things that I talked about all through the campaign, uh, whether it's property taxes, the kitchen table, common sense, and, and cutting taxes. Of course, if you go down aisle eight of any supermarket, uh, I don't think the people in New Jersey are going to agree with everything he said today. And if you talk to any small business owner on Main Street, they won't agree either. Um, New Jersey's unemployment rate is still much higher than the national average. Uh, we've got a labor shortage in the state because I think the governor was too generous for too long with many of the uh, things that were given away. Um, our economy is far from in great position. You still think that, that that's the governor's fault, that people aren't coming back to work? Because that looks like a national trend. Uh, it is a national trend. But listen, I, I do believe the benefits were too generous for too long. There's always going to be hardship cases, and we have to take care of those people. But when this guy talks about cutting taxes, my goodness, he increased the income tax, he increased the business tax, he increased tolls, there's been increases in gas taxes, and I'm really getting tired of governors trying to explain away New Jersey's high property taxes by saying it's the slightest increase we've seen in years. Um, they're still the highest in the nation. And uh, we who seek public office in this state should be doing everything we can to solve that crisis. It's the one tax that touches everybody whether they own or rent, personal or business. You said the state's a leader in new job growth, moving from 47th to 40, innovation and wind power, the growing cannabis industry. Are those not valid accomplishments? Uh, listen, it's the state of the state, David. You expect it to have some of the pomp and circumstance, and that's one thing he excels at, but it's just not realistic. And um, listen, the University of Chicago said the state of New Jersey is the worst in responding to citizens who try to contact any department of state. So if we want to start cherry picking here, there's a number out there that say New Jersey isn't doing so well, including US News and World Report and Forbes magazine, which have us in the 40s with regard to the performance of our economy. I think the governor needs to play it straight with New Jersey. You're not going to BS him with that kind of stuff. All right, running down on time. On these emergency powers, uh, what emergency powers should a governor get and, and not get? Uh, Particularly I said along, as David, that, uh, that I don't have an issue with emergency powers specific to vaccine and test kit distribution. Outside of that, our legislature has an equal role here in governing this state. And the governor seems adamant about taking that role away from them. I'm glad that the legislature is finally standing up and saying, we're an equal partner in this republic of ours. So um, no emergency powers. We have to learn to live with this virus. And uh, the way to do that is by having the legislature play an equal role in governing the right. state. Jack Cittarelli, Republican standard bearer and 2025 gubernatorial candidate. Thanks for your time, man. I'll see you out there. Thank you, David. That does it for our coverage this hour. Thanks to Colleen O'Day and Rhonda Schaffler, John DeMeo, and Jack Cittarelli. Stay tuned for NJ Spotlight News. Raven Santana anchors the broadcast with more reaction to and analysis of the governor's speech and the rest of the day's news. That's coming up next. For now, I'm David Cruz. Thanks for watching. Good night. Major funding for the State of the State Address is provided by New Jersey Education Association, NJM Insurance Group, Orsted, PSEG, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Additional support provided by New Jersey Realtors.